Hey everyone, welcome back to Crown Corner, the channel where we dive into the wild world of entitled people and their unbelievable stories. Hope you enjoy it. And without further ado, let's go. Okay, I work as a door greeter at, you know, where... Haha. <laughs> so, I'm used to compliments like, I like your pins. Where did you get them? Some of these pins are from vacations, conventions I attended, and online. I have this one lady, entitled Mother, who has a kid about seven or nine years old, entitled Kid I don't really know. They always talk to me about one pin her child likes, which is actually a button. It has a griffin, a creature with the front half being an eagle and the other half a lion. It's done by a friend of mine who creates art in the style of My Little Pony, so it looks kind of cute. The entitled kid always loves it and talks about it, and hence she wants it. I told her my friend's website to commission one of her own, but the entitled mother kind of shuts it down with this look. Well, yesterday the entitled kid and entitled mother come in around 7 p.m. and do their normal round of shopping. Usually, it's normal banter. But the entitled mother suddenly just said, my daughter really likes your button and one of your pins. Can you just let her have them? I'm shocked because I know which pin the kid wants and the button. The pin is of Mothra from Japan, and it's my favorite. I tell her no, and that she can find the pin on eBay, and the button was a commissioned work made for me. I actually spent money getting this made for me. The entitled mother just said, I know you didn't waste your money on this stuff. The pin is like five bucks and the button you got for free out of some kid grab bag. I'm shocked and pull up the pin on my phone and show the price to be about $25 and my friend's art commission page, which proves I paid at least $15 for a custom button of my griffin. I tell her no and that she can buy these online and that I will not just give her these. She decides to tell my manager I stole the pin and button from her daughter. My manager, on the other hand, tells the woman that I've had these on my vests since I started in March. My manager also was on my side because the entitled mother is a notorious complainer to nearly everyone in the store. She complains about nearly every service we provide, even if the provisions are needed. She still goes off about the pin and button saying her daughter deserves them and that I'm a grown woman who needs to grow up. My manager tells her to leave me alone and let me do my job. So in short, I am expected to give my own personal property to a customer's child. After saying no, I am accused of stealing from her and that I somehow must give it up because the Mothra pin and my Griffin button are for kids. For your information, I don't know what American kid would like Japanese Godzilla movies currently. I am glad my manager agreed with me and also backed me up. Because I found the thought humorous, I'll be referring to my wife's wifey a lot from now on. Also, I know it seems like I'm posting too fast. But remember, this originally started around 10 days ago, and I haven't wasted time in getting the divorce started. I apologize for the length of this post as I couldn't keep it short. It didn't take me long to find and hire a divorce lawyer. And she's tough. Yes, my lawyer is a woman, and she seems pretty good at her job. She asked me a couple of times if I was sure I wanted to do this. But once I explained my full story to her and showed some evidence, she agreed with me when I said I wanted to start as soon as possible. So, she got the ball rolling. This divorce is going to cost me, but I don't care. I'll rebuild my savings later as a free man. I didn't even want to rent the house I'm currently living in anyway. Wifey pushed for that. I'd have been happy staying in our old apartment until we could actually afford to buy a house together instead. But that's obviously never happening. I'll be paying a lot less for an apartment once we separate. Before coming home, wifey spent some time at a cheap motel when she bailed her mother out of jail. She even threatened to call the police on me when I went to see her there. I changed the locks with my landlord's permission, while wifey was still away and sent her a text saying I'd done so. But I guess she didn't bother to look since she never responded. Upon returning home, she ended up pounding on the door and screaming at me to let her in. I just watched her through the doorbell cam and let her keep it up for a while before she finally got on her phone to call me. I was already walking home from having dinner with my best friend when she called, and I pointed out the text she hadn't read. When I got home to let her in, she was puffy, cheeked, teary-eyed, and red, with a bit of a pouty face. I had a new key ready for her and told her if she gave a copy to her mother again, I'd notify our landlord they were already very angry she'd given her mother a key to begin with. Not sure what the landlord could have done, but it was enough to make wifey comply for the moment. Plus, I'm not going to be living here much longer anyway. 
My mother-in-law still believes she did absolutely nothing wrong and is playing victim to wifey every chance she gets. She's not allowed over anymore, for obvious reasons. I've been repeatedly called a monster by her and wifey. I've never been more glad that my mother-in-law has no friends because then she'd be telling them all her convoluted version of the story to paint me as a villain. I just know it. She was told how much my key collection is roughly worth and what kind of felony charges she could be facing. Though my collection was returned fully intact, she may get the charges lessened. I'd like to hope she gets a decent punishment at least. But I'm not counting on the system to throw the book at a manipulator like her. As I said in my previous post, Wifey also paid her mother's bail and what she owed to the pawn shop with money out of our joint bank account, and then smugly told me that she wouldn't be putting the money back. Basically, that was a terrible power move and her only way to try and put all the cost on me. I've since removed everything I had in that account and stopped all future payments to it so she can't spend my money too. I've changed my passwords to pretty much everything. Wifey flipped out on me for it when she finally checked the account a couple of days ago because that meant that what she paid for her mother's bail and reimbursing the pawn shop was all her money only. And now there was no more access to my funds to supplement her own. I just ignored her tantrum and went into the home office to watch anime on my computer. She banged on the door for a while, demanding I talk to her. I just stayed quiet and put on headphones. Wifey has repeatedly demanded I drop all charges against her mother and even said that if I really loved her, I would not only stop all this but also cover the cost. When I kept refusing, she moved into the spare bedroom. She tried to kick me out of the master bedroom first, but I made it clear I'm not giving up the master bedroom when she's the one at fault. She tried to start taking my stuff out, but I blocked her while pointing my finger at her face and said no, like I was talking to a dog. She ended up crying and saying I was demeaning her, but I didn't care. Then, for some more deception on her part, she admitted to me out of pure spite that until this mess had started, she'd been planning on letting her mother come live with us full-time soon because of the state of her hoarder house. She boasted that she was just going to move her in while I was at work. I told her we were supposed to be equal partners before this all happened, and I was sick of her unilateral decision-making. As long as I'm paying 50 of the lease, her mother will not be living here. And if she tried, I'd throw all her mother's stuff out immediately. Wifey looked like she wanted to explode and stormed off to have a drink and a loud phone call with her mother in the kitchen. I just started removing her stuff from the master bedroom and left in the other room for her. I put a new lock on the door to the master bedroom, too. I had wifey served at her job, which she said really embarrassed her in front of her colleague. She flipped out on me again once she got home. Apparently, she didn't take my threats of divorce seriously until those papers were actually in her hand. She said I couldn't do this, but I told her I was done. She made it more than clear where she stands. I told her I learned a rather interesting phrase online. When people show you who they really are, believe them. She's clearly shown me who she really is, and it's not the woman I fell in love with. That woman disappeared and was replaced with an entitled mommy's girl who refuses to act her age right after we got married. At this point, I don't think she ever loved me, just my wallet. I can't stay married to a woman who conned me into marrying her. Then she started screaming at me that she wasn't a gold digger. So I asked her if she'd have been inclined to stay married to me if I'd done all the same things to her. She tried to deny it at first then looked around like she was trying to find a better answer. Then she just deflected as usual. But I had none of it. I told her right then and there that I'm not renewing the lease on the house with her because I don't want to live with a petulant woman, child I can't trust. And if she wants to keep the house, she can go ahead and start a new lease to move her mother in once I'm gone. Finally, that's when the real waterworks started. She said I was destroying our family. And I said, what family? and pointed out how we don't have kids, and her mother is more important to her than me. We have no family. Then, I just walked away. She loudly cried in the living room for hours, but I ignored her. Now she's giving me the hardcore silent treatment and won't look me in the eyes. I'm actually enjoying it, which just seems to make her angrier. As an added bonus, I warned my current landlord about wifey wanting to move her mother in. I gave him all the details I had about my mother-in-law the state of her hoarder house, and how much of a deceptive mommy's girl wife he is. I warned him that if he let my mother-in-law live in any property he owns, she would turn it into an utter disaster. He thanked me for telling him and is now not going to let wifey renew the lease on her own if she tries. He'll be advertising the property soon. 
Wifey has no idea yet and likely would have only just barely been able to afford the house with her mother's help anyway. One more thing. Yesterday, someone warned me to take my name off the joint bank account entirely so I would not be on the hook for any overdraft. I took that to heart and went to the bank to get it done. It only took a few minutes to do it, and the bank is ten minutes away by car. All good now. I've been working from home lately, so I had the time. All statements from the account were already printed and given to my lawyer, too, so I can wash my hands of it. Edit. I don't know if it's the same rules everywhere, but the bank had no problem removing my name from the account as a cosigner when I pushed for it. There were no debts on the account and had plenty more than the minimum balance. The bank likely did tell wifey. But whether or not she knows I did, it does not matter if she's currently not talking to me. Edit 2. I've noticed a few comments pointing out how it was completely unnecessary to mention my lawyer is a woman. Looking back on it, I did write that like a complete jerk. I was just rather excited in a moment about it. No, that's not an excuse. I acknowledge that. But how quickly this lawyer helped me just made me so happy. I'll make sure not to sound like such an idiot when speaking of her again. Update. I have decided I will no longer be referring to my soon. To be ex-wife is wifey. Even that feels... wrong now. So I'll just be saying soon be ex-wife instead. A few months ago, I anonymously reported my mother-in-law as a serious hoarder. Someone here commented I should report my mother-in-law's hoarding to the fire marshal. And at the time, I decided to do it because I was angry and wanted to get back at her for stealing my collection and making my life miserable. My mother-in-law had been building a hoard in her house since my wife was a teenager. The house was filled nearly to the brim with rotten garbage and was rodent, infested. I've actually seen rats there. I made a call to the city from a number I googled. At first, I thought nothing came of it as weeks went by. But I guess someone looked into it because my mother-in-law's house was given an inspection. The house was found to be in even worse shape than I thought. It was not only a serious fire hazard to itself and everything around it, but also rodent infested. There were some exposed electrical wires and a roof leak that's gone unfixed for years, causing bad rot damage and black mold. The outside of the house didn't look that bad, and it was in a neighborhood full of old houses that looked similar, which is likely why no one reported it till I did. My soon-to-be ex-wife figured out it was me who reported her mother, what with the timing and all. She came home and ranted to me about all the things her mother told her the inspector found and how her mother was likely to lose her house now. But it was only a matter of time before something like that happened. If I didn't report her mother, someone else eventually would have. My soon-to-be ex-wife screamed at me that I was a horrible, deceitful person. I asked her if she wanted to be the pot or the kettle, then reminded her of all the reasons why we were separating. I ended up losing my cool and ranted at her saying that her enabling of her mother caused this. Her acting like her mother stealing my irreplaceable skeleton key collection I've spent a decade building wasn't important caused this. And her selfish unilateral decision-making and bratty behavior ever since we got married caused this. Couples are supposed to make decisions together. Instead, she kept making them for us both without even asking for my input. So I made a unilateral decision of my own for once and reported her mother's hoarding which needed to be reported anyway because it's a danger to her and the people around her. I told my soon-to-be ex-wife I was sick of just sucking it all up all the time and letting things pass while they acted like I was the bad guy and walked all over me. Her mother would get nothing more from me. And maybe she wouldn't be as crazy when she's no longer living in a house filled with fumes of rotten garbage, rodent excrement, and black mold. My soon-to-be ex-wife just walked away, sniffling and cursing me. Yes, I know I went too far. I'd been reduced to being just as petty as her. I made that call because I was angry. But I had no choice but to stand by that decision after I'd done it. My mother-in-law ended up demanding my soon-to-be ex-wife foot the cost of cleaning and restoring the house. But she couldn't afford it. From what I heard, my mother-in-law went off on her with her demands and told her to get the money any way she could, even demanding I pay for it since I was the one who reported the house. She even said to sue me, but my soon-to-be ex-wife told her it wouldn't work. The house was in exceedingly poor shape. Rotten garbage, exposed wires, roof leaks, rot, and black mold. No one should be living in that. 
When my soon-to-be ex-wife tried to tell her mother she couldn't afford to pay for the house to be cleaned and renovated, her mother actually attacked her like a wild animal. She hit and scratched her multiple times and tried to pull her hair out. That's when it happened. My mother-in-law had a heart attack on the spot. Going wild on her daughter must have triggered it. My soon-to-be ex-wife called 911 while looking for aspirin in the house. But by the time help arrived, her mother passed away. My soon-to-be ex-wife came home with a police officer in tow for some reason and was absolutely mad, screaming at me about what just happened to her mother. She said this was all my fault. And in all of her ranting, I found out her mother had a weak heart. It's the real reason why she was on disability. The officer had to separate my soon-to-be ex-wife from me, and she fell onto the couch, sobbing. I hated my mother-in-law with a passion, but I wasn't trying to end her life. I still feel great guilt over this. From what the police officer said and from what my soon-to-be ex-wife said, I pieced the story together and later typed it out. But I just couldn't bring myself to post it. I was still racked with guilt and had to take a serious break from Reddit. That evening when I found out my mother-in-law had passed away, my soon-to-be ex-wife managed to calm down long enough to speak to the police officer more clearly about what happened. But she also kept shifting between blaming herself and blaming me. I asked her from across the room why I was never told about her mother's heart condition. She yelled it was none of my business. But it explains why my mother-in-law used to dramatically put her hand on her chest and cry so many times when she wasn't getting her way. My soon-to-be ex-wife ended up going crazy in the bathroom she'd been using since we started sleeping separately. She asked the police officer for a moment to herself, then went wild after shutting the door. She came out a few minutes later looking angry but calm. Then she told me I was cleaning that mess up. She packed her bags again and left the house for the motel once more, telling me she wouldn't be coming back unless it was to get her stuff. I was so guilt-ridden that I was hardly able to function for days back then and had to take leave from work because of stress migraines. I basically spent three days on the couch hopped up on med. But after that, I got my act together again. My friends all tell me it wasn't my fault. I didn't know, and my mother-in-law was crazy. Either way, what's done is done, and I have to live with it. Sadly, there's more that happened, which I'll be telling in another post. I want to start this by saying this happened over a year ago, but I still think about it all the time and recently retold it to my mom. So, at the time I was 18 and had just had surgery to remove my gallbladder because it was trying to kill me. Side note, the surgery was after six months of trying to get into the ER while in extreme pain and waiting over 15 hours each time without seeing a single doctor. Since I was fresh off the operating table, I couldn't walk on my own and needed to use a cane. While in stores that had them, I used the mobility scooters, you know, because that's why they're there. Me and my husband, will call him H, were at Walmart one day, and I couldn't keep walking with a cane. It was hurting too much, so I told it I needed to grab a scooter. We make our way through the store with little to no problem, but I notice a lady, we'll call her Karen, had been following us. At one point I stood up to look at some chips we were thinking about grabbing when the lady comes around the corner and starts berating me. This is paraphrased because I can't remember exact words. Karen, you're disgusting for taking away a disabled cart. You're not disabled. I mean, ma'am, if you look in the basket, you'll see I have a cane with me. I'm currently disabled and need the scooter. Karen, oh please, that's not a real cane. It's a stick. The cane was my grandmother's and she had made it from a tree that she loved when it had fallen on a tornado. She used it till the day she died and passed it on to me. Me, this is in fact a cane, just not a store-bought one. Now if you'll excuse me, I need to find my husband to give him the chips I want. I then tried to get back on the scooter, but she blocked my way. Me, ma'am, I need to sit back down. I'm in a lot of pain and can't stand on my own for very long. Karen, you're fine. You're young and healthy and don't need a scooter. You're just too lazy to walk? Me, no. I just had surgery and can show you the scars if you want me to, but I need to sit down and get to my husband. Eventually, my husband finds me and tells the Karen to move so I can sit, explaining that I had in fact just had surgery and was in fact in excruciating pain. She moved and was a little white in the face, but left us alone after that. Safe to say the weirdest Karen encounter of my life. 
Enjoying the stories yet? If you do, please subscribe, like, and comment. All right, so there I was, strolling through the mall, minding my own business. I'm a 32-year-old chick who just wanted some new kicks, you know. Nothing fancy, just something comfy. Little did I know, my day was about to take a wild turn, all thanks to an entitled Karen with a temper hotter than a jalapeno. I'm checking out the latest shoe collection when I notice this lady, probably in her late 40s, glaring at the shelves like they owed her money. She had that classic, I need to speak to your manager haircut, you know, the one short and spiky. I figured she was just having a bad day, but boy, was I in for a surprise. So I'm browsing, and Karen struts over to me, all huggy, and goes, you, where's the manager? I've been looking for someone to help me, and no one seems to care around here. I look at her thinking, lady, I'm just trying to find some sneakers, not be your personal shopper. But, you know, I'm a nice person. So I point her toward the actual employees. She marches off, and I think that's the end of it. But oh no, the drama was just getting started. I spot her talking to this poor guy who works there. Let's call him Jake. Jake's got this bewildered look on his face, like he's trying to figure out why his day just took a nosedive. Karen starts barking at him about some shoe size, U.S., sizes or something. I'm not sure. I just wear what fit. Jake, being the retail hero he is, tells her he'll check if they have it in the back. Now Jake comes back with two boxes, one bigger and one smaller. He's all, sorry ma'am, we don't have your size here, but you can check at our other brand. I brought these if you want to try them while you're there. Now I'm thinking, all right, problem solved, right? Oh, how wrong I was. Karen, instead of appreciating Jake's effort, snatches the boxes like she's auditioning for a heist movie. She sits down, trying on the shoes, and then, like a storm rolling in, she drops the bomb. Go fetch my size from the other branch. Chop, chop, she says, waving him off like he's her personal servant. Jake, to his credit, stays cool. He's like, sorry, ma'am, I can't do that. You'll have to check there yourself. And that, my friends, is when all hell breaks loose. Karen, not getting what she wants, goes from zero to 60 in a heartbeat. She takes off the shoes, the ones Jake brought for her to try, mind you, and hurls them at him like she's trying out for the Olympics. Now, at this point, I've had enough. I step in not because I'm some hero, but because throwing shoes at people is just not cool. I give her the classic, are you serious right now? Look and say, lady, what's your deal? You can't just throw a tantrum in shoes because they don't have your size. Chill out. She looks at me like I'm the one who just insulted her entire family. Mind your own business, sweetheart. This is between me and this useless employee. That's it. I whip out my phone, dial 911, and tell them we've got a live one in the shoe store. The Corinne, realizing she's crossed a line, starts blabbering about how she knows the owner and how she's going to get Jake fired. I roll my eyes so hard, I'm surprised I don't get stuck. In no time, mall security arrives and the police aren't far behind. Karen's face goes from angry to pale when she sees the real authorities getting involved. She's stammering, trying to explain herself, but the cops aren't having it. They listen to Jake's side of the story. They hear mine, and they even check the security footage, which, by the way, is probably going viral on social media right now. Long story short, they slap the cuffs on Karen, who's now trying to play the victim card. She's yelling about how she's going to sue everyone and how she knows her rights. As they're leading her away, I can't resist a little parting shot. Maybe next time just buy your shoes online where you won't hurt anyone with your tantrums. And that, my friends, is the day I witnessed the infamous shoe throwing Karen get a one-way ticket to the slammer. The lesson here. If you're having a bad day, maybe skip the mall and do some online shopping. It's better for everyone involved. I was a student at a prestigious high school, and I was determined to succeed in my studies. I was somehow a bright student, and I worked hard to achieve my goals. However, I had a difficult time in one of my classes because of my teacher, Karen. My teacher, Karen, was a strict and demanding woman who believed that she was superior to her student. She had been teaching at our high school for many years and had a reputation for being a perfectionist. Karen expected us to treat her with the utmost respect at all times and would get angry if we didn't meet her expectations. I'd always found Karen's expectations to be unrealistic and her behavior to be unreasonable and volatile. 
She had a tendency to hold grudges and would often single out certain students for punishment or criticism. Karen was known for having outbursts of anger and lashing out at her students if they didn't meet her high standards. Despite her flaws, Karen was a skilled teacher and was well-respected in the community. Many of her former students had gone on to succeed in their studies and careers, and Karen took pride in their achievements. However, her sense of entitlement and her lack of empathy for her students had caused her to become increasingly isolated and disliked by her colleagues and her students. I had always tried to avoid Karen and stay out of her way, but one day she caught me talking to a group of my classmates during class. She immediately reprimanded me and demanded that I stand in front of the class as punishment. Maria, what do you think you're doing? Karen said, her voice dripping with contempt. You know that talking during class is not allowed. Stand up and face the class as punishment. I stood up feeling humiliated and embarrassed. I'm sorry, Mrs. Karen, I said, trying to keep my voice steady. I was just talking to my classmates about our homework. It won't happen again. It had better not happen again, Karen said, scowling at me. I expect complete silence and focus in my class. Is that understood? Yes, Miss Karen, I said, my heart pounding in my chest. However, Karen was not satisfied with my punishment and decided to take things further. She began yelling at me and berating me in front of the entire class. How dare you disrespect me like this, Maria? Karen shouted, her face red with anger. I am your teacher, and you will show me the respect that I deserve. Do you understand? I'm sorry, Mrs. Karen, I said, tears welling up in my eyes. I didn't mean to disrespect you. I was just talking to my classmates about our homework. I don't want to hear your excuses, Maria, Karen said, her voice dripping with disdain. You are a disrespectful and insolent student, and you will be punished accordingly. As the confrontation escalated, Karen lost control and ended up physically attacking me. She grabbed me by the hair and began hitting me repeatedly. The other students in the class were shocked and terrified by Karen's behavior, and they quickly called for help. The school administration was alerted to the incident, and they immediately launched an investigation. My parents were called in by the principal and were shocked and horrified by what had happened. Also, one more thing you should know about my mother. My mother was a strong and influential woman in our community. She had always been fiercely protective of me and my siblings, and she was not afraid to speak her mind or stand up for what she believed in. However, my mother also had a bit of a temper and could be quick to anger when she felt that we were being wronged or mistreated. The principal invited Karen to his office to discuss the incident, and my mother accompanied me. Karen was unrepentant and seemed to think that she had done nothing wrong. She insisted that she had been provoked by my disrespectful behavior and that she had acted in self-defense. Mrs. Curran, I can't believe what you've done, my mother said, her voice shaking with anger. You attack my daughter in front of her classmates and expect us to just brush it off. How could you do something so reprehensible? I'm sorry, Mrs. Rodriguez, Karen said, her voice dripping with insincerity, but your daughter deserved it. At this point, my mother's eyes are blazing with fury. She raised her hand and slapped Karen across the face, the sound echoing through the office. You have caused my daughter a great deal of pain and trauma. I will not rest until you are held accountable for your actions. Karen was shocked and stunned by the slap, and she stared at my mother in disbelief. The principal stepped in to calm the situation, but my mother was beyond reasoning. She was a woman of influence in our community and was used to getting her way. She was determined to see justice done for the attack on me. Mrs. Rodriguez, please calm down, the principal said, trying to intervene. We understand that you are upset, but violence is not the answer. This woman attacked my daughter, and you expect me to stay calm, my mother said, her voice dripping with sarcasm. I will not stand for this kind of behavior in our school. I demand that she be arrested and charged with assault. The school administration immediately launched an investigation, and Karen was suspended from her teaching duties and faced disciplinary action. The incident caused a great deal of outrage in the community, and Karen was eventually fired from her job. She was also sentenced to probation and community service for her attack on me. I was relieved that justice had been served, and I was grateful to my parents for their support. However, my parents were not satisfied with the outcome of the criminal case and wanted to pursue a civil lawsuit against Karen. They believed that Karen needed to be held accountable for the emotional damage that she had caused me and they wanted to seek compensation for my medical bills and therapy costs. Maria, 
We need to hold this woman accountable for what she's done, my father said, his voice grave. She can't just get away with attacking you like that. We need to sue her for emotional damage and get you the help that you need. I don't know, Dad, I said, feeling torn. I don't want to ruin Karen's life any more than we already have. She's already lost her job and her reputation. Do we really need to go through with a lawsuit? She needs to pay for what she's done, Maria, my mother said, her voice firm. We can't just let her get away with it. It's not fair to you or to any other students who might fall victim to her anger. We ultimately decided to pursue the civil lawsuit, and Karen was ordered to pay a significant sum in damages. It was a small victory, but it brought some closure to the incident. Despite everything that had happened, I remained determined to succeed in my studies and to make something of myself. I knew that I had the strength and resilience to overcome this difficult situation and to achieve my goal. The end. Just adding this in so anyone who reads this understands who is who in the story. First part, I am my mother's only child, but... Last part, my dad has two boys that are my stepbrothers. One of my brothers had two children with Karen. Karen was my dad's neighbor. Karen lived in her brother's house. Middle part, Karen's brother, who she lived with, had two kids. Two girls. Let's call them Macy and Tracy. Karen also had two kids, much younger boy and girl. Let's call them Bob and Jackie. Original Poster and Macy and Tracy were closer in age and hung out as kids. After Karen moved in, Karen sent Macy to Original Poster's dad's to steal money out of the safe and accuse him of touching her, just explaining the type of person Karen is for some backstory. Karen is also friends with Original Poster's mom. Years later, Karen kicks her own daughter, Jackie, out on the streets and moves in Jackie's friend. Let's call Jackie's friend, Karen Jar, to Karen's house. Karen Jar has a daughter no one knows who the father is. She showed up pregnant. 20 female. Now Karen claims Karen Jar is more of a daughter. Karen eventually gets sick of Karen Jar and suggested to Original Poster's family Karen Jar move in over there at Original Poster's grandparents' house after Original Poster's grandmother dies. So being the caring man Original Poster's grandfather is and just loosing a wife, he moves in Karen Jar who now claims it's her house and tells Original Poster's family they have to follow her rules now. Original Poster's grandfather now hangs on every word, Karen Jar. And Karen says and treats these strangers better than his own family. Karen is not related to Original Poster's, grandparents or mothers side by blood in any way, but lives across the street from Original Poster's grandfather. Remember Karen had a child with Original Poster's brother, so that makes Jackie Original Poster's niece. Start. My grandfather has lived in the same neighborhood for a long time. He lives in one of the oldest neighborhoods and was one of the first families to move there. My great-grandmother lived right across the street till she passed. My dad lived next door to my great-grandmother's house, and I grew up in this neighborhood up until all of the drama started. That being said, when I was little, everyone in the neighborhood was either family or friends and spent a lot of time together, until the Karen moved in. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me start by explaining the neighbors on the other side of my dad's place. I didn't really know the couple that built the house because they passed while I was young. I just remember the elderly man that couldn't get out of bed whom the son wife took care of, but I digress. Eventually, the son and his family were left the house, my dad's neighbor. The sister whom we will call Karen had nowhere to go and eventually moved in with her brother and his family. All they did next door was get drunk and party. No one watched the kids. They expected me, the oldest kid, to be in charge. No big deal we would take off and ride bikes and explore. I grew up with the son's kids, so me and my dad would always invite the kids to come over to go out on the boat with us or go on trip. I was an only child and liked having friends around. Everything was great till Karen started asking one of the kids to start stealing from my dad's safe and told the kid they would become rich if the little girl said my dad touched her. My dad was dragged through court. I couldn't see him anymore. His name tarnished and business ruined. The girl admitted to being told what to say by Karen and my own mother convinced by Karen locked me in a room trying to manipulate me and convince me into saying my dad touched me when he didn't. I digress. Years later, I am now an adult left to pick up the pieces trying to move on. I come back to this side of the country to visit my grandfather to find out after my grandmother died some strange twenty-ish, female, who we will call Karen Jar, and her daughter is living with my grandfather for free and taking advantage of him. 
Guess whose idea that was? Karen. Karen pushed her own daughter, my niece, out and moved her daughter's friend in just to suggest Karen Jar and her daughter move in with my grandfather. Again, I digress. So, my grandfather ended up in the hospital. I went to his house to spend the night that way I could pick up a few of his things to take to the hospital in the morning. When I arrive, no one is there. It's late my husband and I start getting ready for the morning when Karen G. shows up to my grandfather's house, saying it's her house, and anyone showing up has to call her first. This woman doesn't work, refuses to clean up even her own messes, and refuses to watch her own child, or just leaves the child alone. Now, my grandfather treats her better than his own great-grandchildren, which isn't usually like my grandfather at all. While Karen Jur was trying to tell my husband and I we weren't allowed at my family's home Karen sent over her husband and stepson to gang up on me on the porch to try and intimidate us while she yelled across the street, you and your family don't belong at that house, my kids do. She even threatened to call the cops and claim I assaulted Karen Jur. My husband and I couldn't deal with more drama, so we just left. My mother is the executor of my grandfather's property, and Karen pretends to be my mom's best friend, so my mom never believes me. This just never ends. Does anyone have any advice? Because other than never coming back or speaking to my family, I don't know what to do. Edit. So that this is understood, Karen got pregnant and had my brothers, my dad's son, kids. They never stayed together. Also... I am super sorry for this being so confusing. It is a decade-long story of drama. With drugs, alcohol, neglect, etc. Involved, and this is just the short, short, short version. This happened in a very up-and-coming rich neighborhood in a wealthy area. Thanks for joining us. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe for more captivating stories. Share your own experiences, opinions in the comments below, and let's keep the conversation going. Until next time, stay tuned for more epic tales.